This is Jeffrey Tucker. I'm here with another segment of our uh, systematic walk through uh, Economics in One Lesson, chapter by chapter. And now we're on the very last chapter, which is saving, a uh, chapter on saving, which is uh, packed with uh, information that's relevant to today's economic situations. And I have with me Roger Garrison at Auburn University, our uh, expert on business cycle and macroeconomics generally. Mm -hmm. Roger Garrison. Thank you. Glad to talk about Hazlitt's book. Um, Okay, tell me about his chapter on saving. Um, perhaps you can begin with uh, where we were in 1946 when mm -hmm. he wrote this and why he wrote it. It's a great chapter. Uh, he, he talks about saving as, a, as sort of the essence of the problem of, of the economic thinking of the time. He doesn't mention John Maynard Keynes even once in that chapter. He uh, mentions very few names, but of course that's who he's talking about. Uh, Keynes was against saving. And, uh, because he thought it was spending that got us prosperity. And uh, Hazlitt was there to show us that uh, saving just shows up as spending in another form, in a more socially useful form at that. It seems strange that it would even be a controversy at all to say that saving is actually a good thing, since from an individual point of view, it's always a good thing. In fact, doesn't he tell something of a story that relates macroeconomics to individual yes, the yeah. Yes, yes, the two brothers. Right. Uh, each inherited a good sum of money, and uh, one spends it on consumption, the other one spends very little and saves. And the popular view is that the one that spends is helping the community by creating jobs. But Hazlitt's point, of course, is the one that saves uh, is helping the community more by uh, funneling the saving through investment and increased growth in the economy and increased output in the future. And this again, returns to his theme of what is seen and unseen. That's right. That's right. Uh, it also, uh, what's involved here is is uh, the issue of whether the markets work or not. Uh, the, the economist, Keynes in particular, uh, who argued that uh, spending is good and saving is bad, uh, they argued that partly because they didn't think the market could transform saving into investment. And uh, Hez, uh, Hazlitt is just right on when he brings in the interest rate and identifies that as the market mechanism, as the, as the relevant price uh, that uh, translates saving into investment. The interest rate adjusts so that however much is saved is borrowed by the business community and spent uh, on investment projects, uh, creating output for the future. This, this error that consumption is the reason for economic growth it's still pervasive, isn't it? It is. It is. Uh, and it shows up uh, with these throat-clearing remarks on the news about uh, consumption is 70% uh, of the economy or whatever the current percentage yeah. is, uh, uh, as if that's what we need to pay attention to because that's what drives uh, the economy. It also goes back to Keynes' view that uh, all of the macro magnitudes move up and down together. And so... Uh, if you want to get the economy as a whole, uh, output as a whole to move up and down, well, work on consumption. That's the biggest component. Get it to move up. And, and that's because uh, Keynes wasn't thinking in terms of um, intertemporal coordination of that's economic right. forces. That's right. His, his level of aggregation in his theory didn't allow him to deal with that issue at all. And so uh, consumption is now, saving is in the future. And uh, what, what comes out... Uh, so anything we consume now comes out of the future. Mm -hmm. That's that's the idea, and the, and this model wasn't part of his thinking at all. Everything was right. simultaneous. Well, actually, according to Keynes, saving was just a leakage from the system. Uh, yeah, yeah. It even shows up in the early textbooks, in Samuelson's textbook, yeah. uh, for instance, as a, a hydraulic device where that has a leak, and what's leaking out is called saving. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't help the economy. But again. It's, uh, it's the breakdown of the market in Keynes' view that, uh, that gave him that result. He didn't think the interest rate functioned to coordinate saving and investment. And we still see, I guess in '46 there were attacks on hoarding. That's uh, right. Especially in wartime. I, I can't imagine what people must have been going through. Uh, That's right. That would be the first impulse would be to, if you get something, hold it. That's right. Yeah. And in, in, uh, in some market conditions, there's good reason to hoard, uh, yeah. although hoarding is a pejorative term. It, yeah. Remember, Murray Rothbard used to define hoarding as 
you holding more money than I think you ought to hold. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, everybody holds money, and they make their own choices about how much of it to hold. Uh, uh, Hazlitt indicates that uh, hoarding is rarely the, a root problem of any macroeconomic problem it, or any macroeconomic situation. It may well be that some people hoard more than others and that people hoard more at some times than others. But typically, if it's a problem, it's it's triggered by some policy perversity that gave rise to it. The increasing uncertainty and risk and people respond. Sure. Yeah. And sure. of course, you never hold just to hold things forever. You hold with right. the intention to eventually consume in any case. That's right. Yeah. That's right. The same thing for savings, by the way, that, that the savings is treated as just a, a dead end. Yeah. Uh, even in modern macroeconomic theory, it's, it's pretty much a dead end. Uh, in the classroom, I like to use the expression saving up for something as opposed to simply saving yeah, to emphasize that people are building up purchasing power in order to exercise it sometime in the yeah. future. Now this war on saving that uh, Hazlitt seems to identify, uh, it's been rather effective, hasn't it? Yes, <laughs> yes, I think it has. Uh, the, uh, uh, the lesson is well learned in that book and that, and that uh, uh, savings does make its way into investment and it does give rise to economic growth. And what's happened to savings over the years and what's happening to savings right now? Savings in this country right now is at, a, at an all-time low. Yeah. low. Uh, the statistics on saving out of income, as they express it, yeah. is essentially zero. Yes. Uh, that doesn't mean that nobody saves. It just means that a lot of people are spending more than they're earning and in large part by uh, second mortgages by, by mortgaging uh, uh, the house and spending out of that. And yeah. so if you look at total spending, uh, it's about equal to total income, which means no saving out of income. Now, if I make some money and go and spend it on stocks, is that saving or consumption? Uh, well, buying the stocks is just is saving. And then uh, what the firm does with the funds, the firm that sold the stock, what they do with the funds it's called investment. They buy uh -huh. uh, plant equipment, tools and machinery, yeah. capital goods to increase future output. So as people uh, pull money out of the stock market, presumably that seems to be the trend right now, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and put it into what? Some other uh, 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 riskless investment like government, mm -hmm. government bonds. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a tendency towards greater saving, or is it completely Well, that's a, no, that, that's, that's still saving. Uh, it's not such a hopeful saving if it's being channeled into the government rather than into the private sector. Yeah. But certainly in the statistics, if you look up statistics on saving, it doesn't distinguish between how much of that saving is, is borrowed by uh, firms and how much is borrowed by the government. Although we know that if the government borrows a hefty dose of it, that crowds out, that's the common term, it crowds out private sector activity. Yeah. And you end up with a less productive use of the savings. In an ideal world, um, uh, well, let me just ask it this way. Can you imagine a world in which there would be no such thing as uh, bonds such as government bonds that have absolutely no risk premium, that have a fixed return on them? Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. is, is that is that a world that you think we could we could live in? I don't think that's a world that could exist. And and in fact, uh, even with government bonds, it's not that there's no risk. It's just that the risk isn't borne by the people holding the bonds. Uh -huh. The risk is borne. It's as if it was shunted, shunted into the Atlantic Ocean, but of course it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's shunted onto the rest of us, <laughs> yeah. who, uh, who are responsible for cleaning up the mess once. Uh, when things get all fouled up. <laughs> and this relates to the business cycle, which I think Hazlitt very cleverly, or maybe it wasn't clever, it was just the way his narrative works. Mm -hmm. But in this chapter, he discusses the, the cause of the, of the business does. cycle. He does, and, and you can tell the whole story of the business cycle just by fo focusing on that loan market. That uh -huh. uh, if, uh, if the interest rate is telling the truth, in other words, if it's actually reflecting people's willingness to save, then the economic growth we get is sustainable, is healthy growth, and uh, and uh, it's, it's all good. But uh, if the interest rate uh, is distorted, in other words, is made to tell a lie, uh, and is too low, then the economy is set off on an unsustainable growth path, and uh, uh, eventually it all comes undone. That's the bust phase of the cycle. 
Does he have to use the phrase uh, forced saving here? I don't think he does. Okay. The, the concept is there for sure. Mm -hmm. The term itself uh, has been used to mean many different things, even among the Austrian economists. Mm -hmm. And it's not surprising that uh, Hazlitt, who has a reputation for being such a clear writer, and that's one of the things that characterizes this book, uh, would avoid that term. Okay, not because he disagrees with the concept, but because there are uh, clearer ways of expressing the ideas, which he does very nicely. Mm -hmm. You might say rather illusory saving or imaginary saving, or how would you put it? Well, uh, Hayek uh, uh, called it a policy-induced investment, policy-induced okay. capital accumulation. Uh -huh. In other words, what's, what's called for saving is really a form of investment. It's, yeah. it's committing resources to early stages of production uh, that can't be completed because uh, because there's no genuine saving to see them through the process. So what you're speaking about is a pure model of, uh, of an Austrian uh, business cycle. But every business cycle is different, right? Yes. Uh -huh. right. So you can't expect the same features from everyone. That's true. Yeah. That's true. In fact, uh, what, what tends to happen is, is that uh, business cycles tend to ride piggyback on whatever happens to be going on at the time. Uh -huh. And uh, here, we, here we can see uh, similarity and differences between current situation and, and earlier situations. For instance, in the 1920s, there were technological innovations, uh, mass production of automobiles in the chemical industry and in uh, processed food because of electrification and all that. And uh, the artificially low interest rate just uh, uh, caused an increase there beyond what could actually be sustained. Okay, so you got a, a boom of that sort. In the uh, 1990s, uh, you had a digital revolution going on, yeah. a genuine digital re revolution. But the lower interest rate under the Clinton administration uh, just uh, magnified that beyond what could be sustained. Okay, and so now we have a similar thing. The difference is that it's not it's not something that's going on in the market that got amplified, but some policy perversity, namely subsidizing home ownership. Uh, which was a perversity in and of itself, but it got even amplified further by the increase in the money supply and the low interest rate. Well, you know, I, th I think that's an excellent insight, and it helps account for and this this point that that the new credit that the business cycle sort of pig piggybacks on whatever happens to be going on. At that's the true, and that's that's what makes them different. Okay, and that's partially what accounts for the theory that uh, the cause of the business cycle is some sort of uh, technological shock. Right. That's, a, right. that's also an illusion, isn't uh, it? Because oh, sure. It, it's confusing cause and effect, or it's mis misidentifying the causal factors. That's true. That's true. And it also derives from the fact that uh, the Federal Reserve uh, adopts this real bills doctrine, which uh, suggests that they supply credit at currently available interest rates, which, which essentially uh, causes them to pump money into credit markets when there's an increased demand for credit rather than let the interest rate adjust uh, to that new market condition. Is there any way to know for sure whether or not the interest rate that the Fed is uh, seeking to achieve mm -hmm. uh, is the correct one or mm -hmm. not? No, actually there isn't. And, and, but, that's, but, but that's not at all surprising. In the same sense, there's, there would have been no way in the Soviet Union to figure out what the price of shoes ought to be yeah. if the government, if only the government is creating shoes. So you can't say, well, you it's need too a market. High, it's too low. You're you need a market to tell you what the price of shoes would be, and you need a decentralized banking system to tell you what the interest rate should be. Okay, so uh, your proposal then isn't for the Fed to do a better job at what it does. Right. It's to have it stop doing what it's doing and yes, let the market we, do it. Right, right. We need decentralized banking. <laughs> okay. And this is a, a, a position that has that endorses or, or not? He doesn't get into that. He yeah. doesn't get into that. Uh, the, the spirit of Hazlitt suggested he well might. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Garrison. Thank you.